You're watching a message from Dr. Jim Dixon, founding senior pastor of Cherry Hills Community Church. Jim studied the scriptures, history, and current events to prepare purposeful and insightful sermons. Enjoy this sermon and be blessed. On this, uh, on this Sunday, as we look at this subject, our scripture is taken from the book of 1 Timothy, uh, chapter 6. We're going to take a look at verses 6 through 10, and then 17 through 19. So it's all in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We begin with verse 10. There is great gain in godliness with contentment. We brought nothing into this world. We brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world, but if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. For those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and hurtful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evils. It is through this craving that many have wandered away from the faith and pierced their hearts with many pangs. Now as for the rich of the world, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertain riches, but on God, who richly furnishes us with everything to enjoy. Let them do good, and be rich in good deeds, liberal and generous, thus laying up for themselves a good foundation for the future that they might take hold of the life, which is life indeed. This ends the reading from God's holy word. Let's pray together before we have our message. Dear Father, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Hold in my hand a dollar bill. Doesn't have the purchasing power that once it did. But have you ever wondered why a dollar is called a dollar. Now maybe you're not interested in etymology and you don't care about the derivation of word meanings. But I think sometimes that God does. I mean, you go back to the book of Daniel in the fifth chapter and you see the story of Belshazzar, crown prince, acting ruler of the Babylonian empire. And you see the judgment of God come upon him as the hand of God, that divine hand writes on the royal banquet wall as Belshazzar and his lords are feasting. It's the judgment of God and it's a three word message, many tekel parson. But those words meant nothing to the king. They meant nothing to Belshazzar because they were simply monetary units. It was like God put $10 $20 and $50 on the wall. What did that mean? Belshazzar didn't know, but you see, God was thinking of the etymology. God knew the etymology of those words, and he knew that the word many comes from a root word which means to number. The word tekel comes from a root word which means to weigh. The word parson comes from a root word, which means to divide. These were simply monetary units, and for society, they had lost their meaning, but etymologically, these were the root meanings. And God was saying to Belshazzar, king of Babylon, your days are numbered. You will be weighed, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting, and your kingdom will be divided and given into the hands of the Medes and the Persians. Etymology. So how about the dollar? Does God, does God care about the etymology of the dollar? Does he care about its root meaning? Perhaps. Particularly since the meaning of dollar and the word dollar kind of go back to Jesus. 
Really, it, it all goes back to the grandfather of Jesus, who in church tradition was named Joachim. Joachim was the father of Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. And in those early years, St. Joachim was honored and a valley in Europe was given the name Joachim Stahl, which simply means Joachim Valley, a valley named after the grandfather of Jesus, Joachim Stahl, Joachim Valley. Now in that valley over the course of time, they began to mint coins, and those coins were called Joachim Stallers because they were from Joachim Stahl. But Joachim Staller is kind of a cumbersome word. Who wants to call a coin a Joachim Staller? So they began to shorten it to Staller. And then the word Staller evolved into dollar. And that's how we get the dollar. It all goes back to the grandfather of Jesus, Joachim. And maybe that's good. I mean, maybe when you look at a dollar, you might think of Jesus. Maybe when you look at a dollar, when we look at dollars, maybe we'll realize that what we do with them is very, very important to God. Now we live in a world where most people who go to church do not want their minister to preach on money. People don't want preachers to talk about money. But money is big in the Bible. I mean, Jesus, Jesus told 38 parables depending on how you define a parable, 38 parables and 16 of those parables dealt explicitly with the subject of money. 16 out of 38. And in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one out of every 10 verses, one out of every 10 verses deals with the subject of money. And for every verse in the Bible that deals with the subject of prayer, there are four verses that deal with the subject of money. This is a huge subject to God. And if I, as a pastor, did not speak on the subject of money, I would not be faithful to God, and I would not be faithful to God's word. So today and next week, we look at money. And I would like us to do this in a unique way. I would like us to look at money in the context of four great areas of theology. Now, I've never heard anyone do this, and I've never done this, but I felt led of God to do it today. So I want us to take a look at money in the context of these four areas of theology, two areas today, and then two areas next week. So first, we look at money and soteriology. Soteriology is a huge, important area of theology. So how does money relate to soteriology? How does money relate to salvation? Soteriology comes from soterios, which means salvation. How can we be saved? That's soteriology. And so what is the relationship between money and salvation? Perhaps you're thinking, well, there is no relationship. Or perhaps you're hoping there is no relationship between money and salvation. But you see, you come to the Bible, the teachings of Scripture and the teachings of Jesus, and you see that money is very much related to salvation. So we look at Matthew's Gospel, the 19th chapter, the 23rd verse, and the words of Jesus. Jesus said it will be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. Money and salvation. And of course, you know, through the years, some Christians have tried to kind of lessen or lesser the impact and the meaning of the verse. Some have suggested, well, maybe the word camelos, K-A-M-E-L-O-S, is really meant to be camelos, K-A-M-I-L-O-S, so that instead of camel, it means rope. 
Maybe Jesus isn't talking about a camel going through the eye of a needle. Maybe he's talking about a rope going through the eye of the needle and the image is less severe. Maybe we don't have to be talking about camels here. But of course, there's nothing in the early manuscripts that would suggest there's any kind of a scribal error. The word is definitely camelos and it's camel. Well, others have said, well, maybe, you know, the eye of the needle had a, you know, figurative meaning. I mean, maybe there was a gate in the wall of the city of Jerusalem that was called the eye of the needle. And maybe people could readily pass through the gate, but camels were just a little too big where you had to squeeze and push to get a camel through. So the image isn't so bad. But there's no historical evidence that there was ever such a gate in the walls of Jerusalem called the Eye of the Needle. Some have suggested, well, maybe there was a gorge or a valley that was so narrow, so confining, that an animal or a camel couldn't walk all the way through that gorge. And Jesus was talking about such a valley. But again, no evidence that there was any valley called the Eye of the Needle, no. I mean, the simple truth is that in the time of Jesus, the camel was the largest animal known to Palestine, the largest animal in Palestine, and the smallest opening known to men in that culture and time was the hole in a threading needle. And so Jesus is comparing extremes. The largest animal, the smallest opening, and he's saying it's easier for that large animal to go in through a threading needle's hole, the eye of a needle, than for a rich man to get into heaven. Well, that's a scary thought for the disciples. Money and salvation. And you see, the disciples thought that the rich people were the people blessed of God. I mean, in Judaism and in that first century culture, it was believed that the people who were richest were most blessed of God. Poor people were cursed of God. And so if the rich couldn't get into heaven, those blessed of God, wow, everybody's in trouble. So the disciples said to Jesus, who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, you know, things that are impossible with men are possible with God. So there's hope. But you have this kind of scary link between money and salvation. Money can put salvation at risk. So you look at that statement of Jesus in Matthew 19 contextually. You look at Matthew 19, 16 through 22, and you see that immediately before Jesus made the statement, a rich guy had come up to Jesus. And this rich guy is further defined in, or described in Mark and Luke's gospel, and we know that he's not only rich, he's young, and he's a ruler. So he's a rich, young ruler. And he comes up to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to get into heaven? What must I do to be saved? This is a soteriological question. And Jesus takes him to the old covenant, takes him to the covenant that God had made with Abraham and with Moses. He takes him to the Decalogue. He takes him to the commandments. And this rich young ruler says, you know, I have, I've given my life to the old covenant and I've honored the covenant that God made with Moses and I've kept the commandments from my youth. Jesus looked at this young ruler and he was moved with affection. The Bible tells us Jesus loved him. There was something about this rich young ruler Jesus liked. And Jesus said to the rich young ruler, well, there's one thing you lack if you would find eternal life. You must go sell all that you have. You must go and sell all that you have and give it away. Give it to the poor and then come and follow me. You will have treasure in heaven. And the Bible tells us that this rich young ruler turned around and walked away. And he was exceedingly sorrowful, for he was very, very rich. That's a tough passage. 
And so, you know, through the years, many Christians have kind of given it this interpretation. They said, well, you know, Jesus kind of looked into the heart of this rich young ruler, and Jesus, looking into the heart of the rich young ruler, saw that this rich young ruler had a problem with money. And he was living for it, trusting in it, that he had a problem with money. I don't have a problem with money, so Jesus tells me I can keep everything I've got. That's what a lot of Christians do with this, okay? That's really bad exegesis, and that's bad interpretation of the text. Particularly when you look at Luke's gospel, the 12th chapter, the 33rd verse, and you see Jesus talking to his disciples, and Jesus says to his disciples, go and sell all that you have and give it away. He didn't just say it to one of his disciples, he said it to the 12. Go and sell all that you have and give it away. Luke 12, 33. Oh, that's, that's kind of hard to apply. And it doesn't seem to fit, I mean, with some other passages in the Gospels. I mean, maybe there's some inconsistencies here. I mean, after all, when Jesus would go and visit Mary and Martha and stay in their home, he didn't condemn them for owning a house. And when Jesus went and stayed in the home of Simon Peter and and in the house that belonged to Peter's family, Jesus didn't condemn Peter's family for owning a house. And did not Jesus and his disciples have a company purse, which they used the money from that purse to, to buy goods and food and supplies and to give alms to the poor? And so how are we to apply all this? Well, I think it all becomes clear when you look at Luke 14. And in Luke 14, verse 33, Jesus makes this statement, you must, unless you renounce all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. Unless you renounce all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. We looked at that passage a few months ago, a powerful, kind of a scary passage. And when you look at it contextually, you see that Jesus demands that we would relinquish everything if we would be his disciple. We must relinquish even our families, even our children. If we would be his disciple, we must relinquish all. And the issue is lordship and the meaning of Lord. You know, as Christians, particularly as evangelical Christians, We like to summarize the gospel by saying that people need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If people accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they find salvation. And this is true. Biblically, it is true. But sometimes when we we use the word Lord, we don't really understand what it means. I mean, we view the title Lord as some kind of honorific when the truth is that the root meaning of the word Lord in the Greek and in the Bible, the word kurios, the root meaning is owner. You see, in the time of Jesus, people who were lords were owners. They were owners. They owned property. They owned lands. They were lords. To say that Jesus is Lord of lords is to say he owns everything. To say that God is Lord of lords is to say that he owns everything. And when you come to Jesus and you receive him as Lord, you are renouncing everything. From that point on, you acknowledge you own nothing. You relinquish all of it. If you don't do this, Jesus said, you can't be my disciple. And so from the point you come to Jesus and you take him as Lord, you know he is your owner. He owns your children. He owns your house. He owns your bank account. He owns every dollar in your wallet. He owns it all. He owns your soul. You've made him Lord. And you now become a steward. You now become a steward. And at the end of the day, at the end of your life, you'll stand before him and he will evaluate what you did with his property, his children, his dollars, his souls. 
you'll give an account. This, I tell you, is the gospel. So he who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. It's about ownership and stewardship, and this must be your new worldview. I promise you, uh, if you don't have this worldview, you'll never use money in the way that Jesus wants you to use money. If I don't have this worldview, I'll never use money in the way that Jesus wants me to use money. Now you come to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, and Jesus tells the story there of the rich man and Lazarus. And Lazarus is a poor guy who's begging at the rich man's gate. And Lazarus is ulcerated and afflicted, and he's starving and impoverished, and he's begging. And he's at the gate of this rich guy who owns this lavish estate. Jesus says, tells us that the rich man <clears throat> was eating sumptuously, and the poor guy would gladly have eaten the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And Jesus tells us that in the course of time, the two die. The poor man and the rich man, they both die, and they have different destinies. And so the poor guy goes to Abraham's bosom, paradise, and the rich guy goes to Hades. And of course, this is, in a sense then, a soteriological passage, right? I mean, this has something to do with salvation, and it has something to do with money. Something to do with money. And, and of course, there's a deeper issue, clearly. And the deeper issue is surely the soul. Something was wrong in this rich guy's soul. And, and he viewed himself as owner. He actually believed himself Lord of his property, Lord of his soul. He viewed himself as owner and not a steward. Didn't realize he was going to have to give an account. Kind of a scary passage. Of course, you come to Luke 12, and Jesus tells the parable of the rich fool. Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. Jesus says, hey, there's this rich guy, and he's getting richer and richer, accumulating more and more. Pretty soon he has so much, he's got to build more homes and more buildings to store his stuff. He's so rich. And he begins to feel pretty secure. And he says to his soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. But God says to him, you fool. You fool. This day your soul is required of you. And the things that you've accumulated, whose shall they be? Jesus said, so shall it be. For all who are rich towards themselves and not rich towards God. Now, are you rich towards God? Am I rich towards God? How is your soul? How is my soul? Is Jesus my Lord? Is Jesus your Lord? And are we stewards? Knowing that someday he's going to evaluate us. Of course, you know, a few years ago, I preached a sermon, and you know, I was really controversial. Every once in a while, I preach a controversial sermon, and I, I get in trouble. People fire off emails and write me letters. And in this sermon, I, I, I said that there are people who claim to be Christians, but go through their whole life and give nothing to the cause of Christ. I mean, they claim to be Christians and they do not give any of their money to the church or even to parachurch ministries. They give nothing to the cause of heaven on earth. And then I made this statement. I said, most of them are going to hell. And I got emails. 
I got emails, I got letters. And I tell you truly, I believe it as much today as ever I did, because it's true, and it's in the Bible. The issue really isn't money. You know, the issue is the soul. I mean, it's not people abuse money and therefore they can't go to heaven. People don't give their money, therefore they can't go to heaven. No, it's not that. It's that these people really don't belong to heaven. They're not of heaven. They're not citizens of heaven. Therefore, they don't give their money. They don't give their money. They don't serve heaven on earth. And they think they're lords and owners, not realizing it's all his. Now, people don't like sermons on money. I've said that. Don't want me to preach on money. And think about it. I, not a lot of Christian music has anything to do with money. We don't sing a lot of money hymns. There's not a lot of money praise songs. We don't sing about giving our money. We don't sing songs like that, do we? You might think, well, what about bringing in the sheaves? Is that about money? And it is true that I've seen some of those old westerns, you know, where they're kind of in a church and they're taking an offering and the congregation is singing, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. The song really didn't have anything to do with money. It was written by a guy named Knowles Shaw, and he wrote that song in 1874. And four years later, after writing Bringing in the Sheaves, four years later, he died tragically in a train wreck as the train derailed. And two guys that were in the same coach with him and survived said that before the wreck, before the tragedy, before he died, he was talking to them about how much he loved evangelism and how much he loved to tell people about Jesus and how much he loved to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. And the irony is that's what bringing the sheaves is about. That's what that song is about. It's about the fields are white for harvest, and it's about the spiritual harvest of souls through the gospel, not about money. But I was thinking, you know, there is, there is a song that I've sung that has to do with money. And I think it's a song that many of you have sung too. The song was written in 1922, as a poem in 1922, and, and then in 1930, a young man, 21 years old, a young guy, 21 years old, took the words of the poem and converted it into a song and wrote the music. And this 21-year-old young man was named George Beverly Shea. And he had just been on a radio program with Fred Allen and he had a chance to sing before the entire nation. And in the aftermath, he was offered contracts which could have made him very rich and famous. But he found this poem, and he wrote the music to I'd Rather Have Jesus. And of course, George Beverly Shea is 98 today, still singing when Ruth Graham died, George Beverly Shea just sang at her funeral. And of course, George Beverly Shea, Cliff Barrows, Billy Graham, they've ministered together for 60 years. But I'd rather have Jesus, he wrote. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than have Houses and lands, I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain or to be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything the world affords today. And I think today, I think today uh, Christians hear those words or hear that song and they think, well, yeah, I want to have Jesus, but I also want silver and gold. 
Why can't I have it all? Why can't I have Jesus, silver, gold, houses, and lands? Why do I have to make a choice? Why can't I have it all? They don't understand the gospel. Unless you renounce everything you have, you cannot be my disciple. I mean, you've got to make a choice. If you have Jesus, you have nothing else. You relinquish it all. He owns it all. If you take Jesus, you've got nothing else. You give it up, and you become a steward. And you understand, you know, to some of his disciples, those who followed him as he went around Palestine from village to village, he said, hey, take and sell it all. Give it away. Follow me. I mean, we're going to be going from village to village, town to town, by the law of the Jews, we can eat off the fields, the grain fields and the orchards, and we will rely on hospitality, and we'll have a small company purse, but go and sell everything and just come and follow me. It's mine, you just do what I tell you. It's not yours anymore, I'm the Lord. Just do what I tell you. Now to other disciples of Christ, he allowed them to keep their homes and, and keep their possessions, but he reminded them it's not theirs. It belongs to him, and they're just stewards now. Just stewards, and they're going to have to give an account what they do with every dollar. It's the gospel. Well, time is short, but there's a second theological category, and that's eschatology. We'll look at two more next week, but eschatology. What does money have to do with eschatology? We've seen its relationship to soteriology. What about the eschatos? What about the eschaton? What about the last things? Eschatology is the study of the end of the world, the consummation of the age. What does money have to do with the end of the world? And what does the Bible tell us? It's going to be true of money when we approach the end times. Well, the Bible's pretty clear. So you come to 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says, in the last days, and the Bible then begins to describe the last days, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and it describes people in the last days, and the Bible says they will be characterized by philargaros. Philargaros means the love of money. In the last days, people will be lovers of money. Now, the Bible in that same passage uses philatos, lovers of self, and the Bible uses Philedone, lovers of pleasure. And in fact, that passage says they will be lovers of pleasure rather than philotheos, rather than lovers of God. So in the last days, people will love money and self and pleasure rather than God. Now, you might be thinking, well, now, hasn't this always been true of people? I mean, haven't people pretty much always loved self and money and pleasure more than God, and perhaps, perhaps that's always been true. But you see, in the last days, this will be true to a greater degree. And in the last days, this will be more critical because you're approaching the end of all things. You're approaching the end of the world and people are tied up with themselves and their pleasure and their money. And really, it's all about love. Lovers of money rather than lovers of God. Lovers of self rather than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It's all about love. And that's why in our passage of Scripture for today, 1 Timothy 6.10, we're told the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. It's all about love. And in the last days, there's just going to come a crisis in the realm of love. I mean, you look at Luke 18, 8, and Jesus, Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes again, when I come again, will there be faith on the earth? Good question. Will there be faith on the earth? 
And then you look at the all of that discourse. Luke, excuse me, Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. Matthew 24, verse 12, the all of that discourse, Jesus says, in the last days, the love of mankind will grow cold. In the last days, the love of mankind will go, grow cold. So that there's a crisis in this realm of love. In the last, last days, we love the wrong things. We don't love the Lord. And as Jesus continues with the Olivet Discourse, and his whole focus is on the end times and the last things, he tells the parable of the talents, and he tells the parable of the sheep and the goats. And in the parable of the talents, he's talking about money. And to one person, the Lord, the master, when you look at the parable of the talents and the parable of the pounds, the Lord, the master, the king, entrusts to his people, to his servants, money, bags of gold, five bags to one, two two bags to another, one bag to another, talents, gold. And then this Lord who represents Jesus, leaves with the promise that one day he'll return and he'll judge what you do with it all. And of course, when he returns, there's one servant who did not use his gold or his money to serve the master. Did not use it to serve the master, and so the Lord says to him, cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth has to do with soteriology and eschatology, and has to do with money. Now, of course, the bags of gold in the parable of talents represents more than money. It represents everything that's been entrusted to us, but one day, you see, we have to give an account. And this will be true eschatologically. And, and really, you look at the parable of the talents, and it has to do with how much you love the master. And you look at the parable of the sheep and the goats, the sheep and the goats, and it has to do with how much you love people. It's all about love, and there's a crisis at the end with regard to love and the way that money and love interplay in terms of what we love. Now, as we close, as we close, I want to mention the Battle of Jericho. I know most of you have read Joshua uh, chapters 6 and 7, and Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho, and you know the story. And, of course, one of the stories that comes out of the Battle of Jericho in Joshua 6 and 7 is the story of Rahab. And you know that Rahab was a non-Jew. She was a Gentile, a non-Jew. And she was a prostitute. But Rahab had heard about the God of the Israelites. And she had heard about how the Israelites had crossed the Red Sea as if upon dry ground, and the Egyptians, when they tried to do the same, drowned. She thought, this God must be great. She had heard about how the Israelites had defeated the Amorites and had cast down two Amorite kings, and, and she believed, she'd begun to believe in Yahweh Elohim, the God of Israel. And so she began to aid and abet the the, uh, the Jewish spies, as they were seeking the conquest of Jericho, she began to help the Jews. And in the aftermath of the Jewish victory by the hand of God, in the aftermath of the victory, she became a hero. Now you come to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew's gospel, the first chapter, you see the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And incredibly, you see that Jesus is descended through the line of Rahab the harlot. She has become such a hero that through her line comes the Son of God. And what a story of amazing grace and amazing mercy. And so in the course of my life, I've heard many people preach sermons on Rahab because it's about mercy and grace, and we love sermons about mercy and grace. But you see, in the same chapters, Joshua 6 and 7, there's a story of another person. And this other person is Achan, and Achan is of the tribe of Judah, and Achan misuses God's money and the judgment and wrath of God descends from heaven. I've never heard anybody preach a sermon on that. We don't like sermons on that, judgment and wrath. But you see, Achan, in the aftermath of the battle, 
there was the treasury of Jericho just sitting there. And the Jews knew and they understood that it was devoted to the Lord, that treasure. And the treasury was devoted to the Lord. But Achan went and stole some of the silver and gold for himself, bringing the judgment of God upon him. Now, the Jews took that story of Achan and they applied it to the tithe. So the Jews would, would take the story of Achan and the rabbis would say to the people, the tithe is the Lord's, it's devoted to the Lord. And if you steal from the tithe, you invite the judgment and wrath of God. Here we are today. Here we sit today. Here I stand. And you know, we're Christians, followers of Jesus. And I still believe the tithe is the Lord's. I don't believe the tithe was re, re, uh, revoked or repealed in the New Testament. There's not one shred of evidence that the tithe is, is uh, you know, canceled by the New Testament. The only place where, where Jesus deals with the tithe, he's talking to the Pharisees and he calls them hypocrites because they tithe minutia, they tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and they ignore mercy and love and justice. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you should, you should live lives of love and mercy and justice while not ignoring the tithe. Do this without ignoring the other. So he doesn't repeal the tithe. And I believe the tithe is the Lord's. And I believe we're robbing God. I believe the church of Jesus Christ, as we approach the end, is robbing God. And it's about love. It's really about love. And so 40% of our congregation gives nothing to the church. I hope, literally I hope to God, you're giving somewhere. And I hope you're giving radically because it isn't yours. He's the Lord, we're stewards. Studies show that, surveys show that most Christians give only 2% of what they make. And we're the rich of the world. You know, the average income in our zip code where our church resides, the average household income is 130000 a year. We're in the upper percentiles globally, even when you take into account uh, relative costs of living. It's a scary thing. 2%. And the strange tragedy is, as, as Christians make more and more money, the percentage they give to Christ is less and less. You know, I get magazines, I get tons of Christian periodicals and secular ones, and I, you know, it's very evident that we have a crisis in the Christian world particularly in the Western world where the numbers of Christians are diminishing and people in our culture and in our nation are moving into pluralism and syncretism and, and other religions and atheism. I mean, the USA, the Christianity Today website just this week claims that less than 20% of the people of America are true believers in Jesus Christ, truly follow Christ. God only knows God only knows, but you see, something's wrong eschatologically as we're moving towards the end. We're loving the wrong things. And it's the church, it's Christians, we're the ones loving the wrong things. We're lovers of self rather than lovers of God, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, lovers of money rather than lovers of God. And so, you know, our share of the pie and shrinking the Christian world, getting into crisis, getting smaller. And, and it's all because as Christians, you know, we think we're lords. And he's the Lord. He owns it all. We renounce it all. And we are now our stewards. You know, I, I volunteer in some ministries. I volunteer over at Valor and I serve on their board, I, I volunteer over at Colorado Christian University, serve on, on their board. I'm on the National Advisory Board for Fellowship of Christian Athletes and, and I serve with different things locally. Uh, and I feel like 
I would be a hypocrite if I asked you to volunteer your time if I wasn't volunteering my time. And, you know, I tithe, and I feel like I'd be a hypocrite if I asked you to tithe, and I didn't tithe. And as Barb and I have been blessed, we try to go beyond tithe and give more, and I'd be a hypocrite if I asked you to do that, if we weren't doing that. And you see, there are thousands of ministries out there I could volunteer in any one of them, except I don't have time to volunteer in thousands of ministries, but there are thousands of wonderful ministries out there, and they all need money. They all need money, but they don't get it. And it's not that we who follow Jesus Christ don't have it. We have the money to fuel all of these ministries. But the Christian world's hurting because, man, you know, we think we're lords. We think we're owners. We don't understand we're stewards and it's all his. And we're loving the wrong things. We're loving the wrong things. Well, Jesus is watching. You know, Mark chapter 12, Jesus is sitting outside the treasury in the city of Jerusalem, watching the Jews give their money to the cause of heaven. And they're putting their money into 13 different trumpets, which went into 13 different boxes, and Jesus is watching. Wow. And he sees this widow woman come and give all that she has. And Jesus turns to the disciples and praises her. He's watching today, still watching. He watches everything we do with every dollar and dollar. And I got to tell you, for Barb and I, I mean, I'm convicted. This is scary stuff. So what are we living for? Next week, we'll look at money, context of the church and our global mission. Look at money in the context of ecclesiology and missiology. Very, very important. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love for us. Now, there's no one here by accident this day. Lord, you want to change our lives. You want us to renounce all that we have and follow you. You have tied this, in some sense, to salvation because it's a matter of the soul and it's a matter of lordship and ownership. And Lord, you've told us that in the eschaton, in the last days, our love would grow cold. Lord, don't let that be true of us. Help us to love you more than anyone or anything. And Lord, help us to be people who are all about serving the cause of heaven on earth. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.